Hey, welcome to another video. So in this video, we're going to talk about exponential growth and decay or natural growth and decay, uninhibited growth or decay. This stills into something called differential equations, at just a very surface level, but how we can use some exponential modeling to deal with populations, population growth, population decline. Um, exponential growth models a lot of population growth, even money, which we saw in finance. And then exponential decay, that's stuff like half-life. So we're going to talk about, about that. Or Newton's Law of Cooling, that'll be our last example. We are not going to get into the logistic modeling. That happens more in differential equations, and I, I couldn't do the service here. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I do cover those topics, but that's that, in my opinion, you need to understand a little bit more about this in order to, to really make that make sense. Otherwise, it's just a formula, and you can do it with a formula, but it's much better if you really understand it. So this we can understand because it's based on an exponential. So we're going to get into it. We'll talk about what it means. We'll take a look at it as an exponential function. We'll notice it's very, very strongly related to continuously compounded interest. It's the same. And then we'll deal with three examples on, on, uh, on working through this. So. Firstly, the, the look of it. This looks just like continuously compound interest. It gives you a present value or an initial amount. It says you are adding to it all the time, just like continuously compound interest was every moment, every minute, every second, every day. This population is growing or declining based on some sort of a rate. That K is your rate and some time period. Now, the T does not have to be years. It can be minutes. It can be hours. It can be whatever we want it to be, um, but it is a, a period of time. I hope that you're seeing that this is just like continuously compounded interest. It's just we're, we're growing population instead of money, a population of whatever it is instead of just a population of dollars and cents. Very, very valuable for us. Now, one thing that we're seeing, I've just already defined them, but a sub zero is your initial amount. It's like your principal or your present value. T is a time period, not necessarily years, and A is your future value or how much is going to be in that population after a certain amount of time, after whatever that time is. The issue here that we have is the rate. You see, in compounded interest, your rate is positive, meaning you're always growing money. Well, for population growth or decay or decline, we have to have the ability to have a downward or decreasing graph, and that would be exponential decay. That depends on whether the K is positive or negative. Positive Ks mean growth. Negative Ks mean decay. So why? Why would that be the case? I really want you to focus here, because if you put a negative right there, what does it actually mean? Check it out. If this had a negative K, then this piece right here, you could move that to the denominator of some fraction, or you could create a fraction itself. Do you remember, I showed it to you one time before, that if I want to change the value of an exponent, I reciprocate my fraction. I can actually do that here. So if I think of this instead of e to the negative kt, I think is 1 over e to the positive kt. I really need you to make this connection. Do you remember that with exponentials, if bases are more than 1, 2.7, we get climbing graphs. If bases are less than 1, that's 1 over 2.7, we get declining or decreasing graphs. This is why a positive k means grow. It's this. Or a negative k means decay, decline, decrease. That's because it's this. That negative exponent creates that base that's less than 1. I hope you're seeing it. Uh, we don't really show this very often, but I wanted to make that connection. Otherwise, you go, why does negative k actually do that? Because it creates a fraction. Because it creates that, that, uh, that fraction that's less than 1, giving us an exponential function with a base less than 1. That is a decreasing graph. That's why a negative exponent here decays. Hope it's making sense to you. So we're ready to go through a couple examples. We'll go through a very basic one, one that I've contrived for you here, and then we'll go ahead and, uh, and come up with a couple on our own. One with growth, one with decay. Then we'll do Newton's Law of Cooling, which is kind of cool, and, uh, and we'll be done. So let's suppose that we're given some sort of an exponential model of a population. This, in this case, was bacteria, I think. It starts with 100 units of bacteria, and it says that you have this 0.045. Well, what's that mean? For a certain amount of time, let's say it's in hours. 
Can we figure out a few things about it? Number one, can we determine whether this is growth or decay? If you look at your rate, positive rates mean growth. For some reasons I just explained to you, negative rates, rates mean decay because they would create a base that's less than one. This is a base greater than one because that is positive. If that's negative, we could, could create a base less than one that would give us a decline. So positive rates cause us to grow. So this is definitely growth. And you could write the rate. The rate is 0 0.045 or 4.5% growth per time period. And let's say that if our time is hours, that would be 4.5% growth in hour. So every hour, this bacteria is growing 4.5%, 4.5%. Every single hour that's happening. Now, how about the initial amount? The initial amount is always that number in front of your E. Think about, man, just think about um, doing the, the continuous compound of interest, how your initial amount was your principal or your present value. It's the number in front. Your initial amount is 100, whatever this is, units of bacteria or grams, something like that. So I'm going to leave this unit list. I'm just put units. How about the amount after five days? Well, because this is asking you for a certain amount, the colony size after five days time. Uh, oh, you know what? It says days. So our hours was wrong. So we always have to match this up. This would be a mistake and I'm glad I put it. I want you to really learn from it. Whatever unit of time they're telling you. So this would be days. You need to add, match that. So if I say 4.5% per hour, that really conflicts with our days. So make sure that you, your units of time, because they can be hours or minutes or days or weeks or whatever, make sure they mesh together. I actually meant hours here, um, which is why that was. I just wrote days, so good thing we got this. I'm gonna change that to uh, hours so that I can match that up. So 4.5% per hour, 100 units initially, it's called our initial amount. That's like the present value for talking population. How much after five hours? Well, because this is the calling size after a certain amount of time, all it's really asking you to do is plug in five. So C of T, well, our T is five hours now. Just plug in the T, the T of five. So on our calculator, we'll put 100 second LN, and then we'll have our parentheses of 0 0.045 times five. I get about 125.2 units, whatever that is. If it's grams, it'd be 125.2 grams, or sometimes we do call it units of bacteria. Uh, we would get that many after five hours. I hope that makes sense. I hope you're seeing that this is very much like compound interest. What about a different question? What about how long would it take to reach 140 units or 140 whatever these, these are? Well, that's different, isn't it? That's saying if you start with 100, well, that's, that's a given. That's there for us. This is our formula. How long is it going to take to reach 140? Well, 140 is a future value of this population size. Let's, let's make it that. Let's consider this to be what would be in the future. Well, how long is the future? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. We're trying to figure out the T. How many hours would it take to reach that? So we're going to take a formula and say, I want it to be 140. But I don't know what the T is. I hope that this looks a lot like doubling an investment, because we're going to do that next. But in this case, we're not doubling it. We're just reaching a goal. We're saying we're starting with 100. How long is it going to take to reach 140? 140 would be the idea of that's going to be a value in the future. Let's solve for the T. In your head right now, you should be thinking, I'm going to be using a logarithm at some point. I have to because that's an exponential equation. I'm solving for T. That's a must. But before we do that, before we're able to use logarithms, you must isolate the exponential. So we're going to divide by 100. So dividing by 100, 140 divided by 100 is 1.4. Now we have an exponential equation. It doesn't matter if it's a decimal or not. We're going to do a logarithm on both sides. For this, just man, just like always, 
use LN, please use LN, especially when we're dealing with exponential growth and decay because you're gonna get a lot of simplification. So we're gonna take a natural log of both sides. And because we match up our bases, we compose an exponential onto a log of the same base. This is gonna simplify. We get LN of 1.40. equals 0 0.045t, so just like doubling uh, your compound interest when it was continuously compounded in the last video, we're doing the same thing. It's just that we're not doubling, we're reaching a certain, a different goal. If we divide both sides by 0 And understand that this is asking for for the number of hours. So our T is in hours, as it said here, and as it said right there, number of hours. Well, we're going to plug this into our calculator. We're gonna evaluate. Just make sure when you press your LN that you do 1.4 and end your parentheses before you divide. That way your calculator knows what you intended to know. Yeah, roughly 7.48 hours. Now, does it make sense? Does it, does it make sense that if after five hours we had 125 units, then it's going to take a little bit longer than that for us to get 140 units. Well, that makes sense to me. Five hours gave us this. Set this to be more than that to give us 140, but not like three times as much. Remember, it is growing exponentially at a rate of 4.5% per hour, whatever the time unit is. Okay, last one. This is just like doing our continuously compounded interest. If we're going to double something and we actually know how much we start with, then we're going to deal with the same exact idea. Doubling means multiplying by 2. When we divide, we're not going to get 1.4 like we did. We're going to get exactly 2. So let's see how that, that plays out. How long to double this? Well, if I start with 100... Doubling would be 200. And I'm still looking for a time. I'm still going to do a natural logarithm on both sides. But in order to do that, I have to divide first. Let's divide both sides by 100. Isolate your exponential. You have to do that before taking a logarithm. So 2 equals e to the point 0.045t. That is an exponential. There's no common basis. We have to use a logarithm. And in general, we just use ln almost all the time. This naturally composes your base of your logarithm with the base of an exponential, a function with its inverse cancels. We get ln2 equals that 0 0.045t. We're going to divide both sides by 0 0.045. We have parentheses after the ln2 that's really important for your calculator, and it should be a bit more than 7.5. So I got 15.4 hours, and that makes sense. To gain 40 units cost us 7.5 hours. To gain 60 more units on top of that would be an additional almost double, well, a little over double that, but we're gaining 60 additional units. So 100 to 140 was seven and a half hours, 100 to 200 was 15.4, so it makes sense. It's not way, way out there, like 100 hours or something. Remember, this should be gaining faster and faster and faster. It is positively increasing exponential growth. Hope it makes sense. Hope you're seeing all the interplay between this, and I hope I'm really making the connection between exponentials, this stuff, and the finance that we just did. I'll come back with another one that we're going to start from scratch and create a formula that models exponential growth. Then we'll do a half-life for decay and Newton's law of cooling. All right, we're ready for another problem. Let's give it a try. We're supposed to find a formula for a population bacteria that doubles every three hours. Uh, so let's take a look at this and model this with an exponential growth formula. In order to do it, we just have to understand a couple things about the process here. What's going to happen is we have to find our rate first. So it's going to give you enough information to plug in everything and solve for your K. That is your first thing to do. Once you've found your k, you can ask any other question that you want on this thing. So it's all about finding the k first and then plugging that back in. Then you answer the question. So let's take a look at it. Find a formula for population bacteria that doubles every three hours. There's a lot of information there. Number one, it's saying there's a time period. We have three hours, so we're, we're in a time unit of hours, and saying after three hours, we're going to put a three here, 
This should be two times that. Now, what is that? Who cares? It doesn't matter. We dealt with this in doubling an investment and doubling bacteria. It doesn't, doesn't matter where we start. If we start at one, this would be two. Start at 100, this would be 200. It doesn't really matter. And it also doesn't matter because we divide in the very first step to try to solve for our K. So let's plug in a few things. We know that we're trying to solve for K. It's not telling us the rate. We need to understand that. But it's telling us after three hours, that's our three hours, this future value or the, the population will attain this amount that's double what our initial amount was. If that's one, that's two. If that's 10, that's 20. If that's 100, that's 200. The very first thing we would do is try to solve for K by dividing that isolated or exponential. We divide both sides, but whatever initial amount is, you're going to get 2 equals E to the 3K. This is what doubling looks like all the time once you have isolated your exponential. Um, a couple other things about this that I would like to mention. You can see a, a few different, different things. They could say something like, hey, your population of bacteria is growing at a rate of 5.2% per hour. If they tell you that, 5.2% per hour, well, then that's a K of 0 0.052. You can always find that. That is your rate. So if they're telling you the rate, you don't need to do any of this. You just say, hey, that rate would be whatever percentage you're telling me as a decimal. You can always do that. The other thing I can tell you is instead of doubling, I just want to make sure that that's, that's fresh in your head. I could say uh, a population of bacteria started with 100 units. After three hours, it had 170 units or something. And so in that case, you'd say, I started with 100. After three hours, I had 170. It's the same exact thing. I'm just telling you double because students tend to have a harder time with the double. If I say you start with 100 and after three hours, you have 170. Sure, you can divide by 100. We saw this in the first example. And it gives you something very, very doable, very similar to this. It's just a different way to look at it. Um, if you wanted to see the, the first way right now, if I told you that the increase was 5.2% and they said you start with 100 units and your rate of increase is 5.2%, then you are done. There's your initial value and there's your rate of increase. It said rate of decrease, well then you would have negative. 0.052%. So there are other ways to look at it. I'm giving you the most common though. All right, so we're down to here. We got to solve for our K. We need to, to take it a natural log on both sides. So we're going to do that. Because our basis maps on our function and our, uh, the inverse of the function, we end up getting ln2 equals 3K divided by 3. we get k equals ln2 over 3. So I got k is around 0.231. Now, I'm going to encourage you to not round that number very often. Those can be very, very, very small numbers, uh, very close to zero. And if we end up rounding them a lot, that's a problem. You might actually choose to leave it ln2 over 3 and just put that here. It looks a little awkward. I'm not doing that because I want to show you the rate. The rate of increase here is 23.1%. 0.231 is 23.1% per hour. That is how fast this colony of bacteria is actually growing. So what does that mean for us? Now that we have our K, and our K is a constant, it's like the rate in finance. Your rate doesn't change every day. I mean, it can, it can but if it's a fixed rate, it's going to stay the same all the time. We're, we're assuming this is a fixed rate of growth for this. And we can see with that k that that is positive. That should be exponential growth. This is modeling this bacteria. And now I can ask a whole lot of questions. So I can ask something like, if your colony started with 50 units or grams or whatever, if I say it started with 50, how much will be there in 10 hours? We put 50 here and 10 there. If I said, how long would it take to triple this colony of bacteria? that I put one here and three. Let's go ahead and do that one. How long would it take to triple this? 
Better be more than three hours, right? Because three hours is how long it took to double it. But how long would it take to triple this? How long asks for a time? Triple says if you start with one, you'll get three. That would be triple. I start with 100, I get 300. Your first order of business would be to divide. So we're going to end up getting three equals 0.231t. If we do an ln on both sides, and we divide by 0.231, We get about 4.76 hours. Uh, I hope that makes sense. I hope that if it doubles in three hours, it should triple in 4.76 hours. That should make sense in your head. That It's more than three. It's not way, way out there, uh, but it's definitely positive in more than three. Again, if I had said, um, suppose you start with 50 units, how much would you have in 10 hours? You could certainly put a 50 here and a 10 there and figure that out as well. This is just designed to give you an understanding of how exponential growth and decay work from an original question like that one. I decided to do two examples because they're slightly different and I know I would get questions on that one. So I'm gonna put it up there to make sure that we, uh, we understand the differences between them. So we're gonna talk about exponential decay right now. Half-life is a really good way to, to look at this. Because if you think about something that's radioactive, something that's constantly losing stuff, it's going to lose a lot of stuff at first because there's a lot of it to lose. But as we get closer and closer to having none of it, it's going to still lose at the same rate, but there's less to lose. Well, you lose everything. Not according to exponential decay. You have a horizontal asymptote, don't you? So can you ever lose all of a substance theoretically? No, you'll get closer and closer to zero, but you never lose all of it. So there'll always be some left. And that's a decent way for us to date certain items. So how in the world do, do we do these, these things? Uh, the same exact way as the last example, but we're gonna get exponential decay because we'll have a negative exponent. And that would create, if we use that negative to reciprocate a fraction, a base less than one, giving us a decreasing exponential graph. That's what's gonna happen. So let's take a look at it. The half-life of radium is 1,690 years. If 20 grams are present now, how much will there be there in 50 years? For all of these examples where you have to make your own formula, your primary goal is to find K first. So let's start with our, our function. We're thinking half-life means declining. Our k should be negative, so that's important. Now, half-life. Here's what that means if you're not familiar with it. Uh, what half-life means is there will be half of whatever you start with after a certain amount of time. For radium, that there will be half of it after a certain amount of time. That time is 1,690 years. So if you started with 100 grams of radium, after 1,690 years, there would be 50 of it left. The other 50 will have radiated away. And that's what radiation does. It, 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 these particles emanate uh, from whatever substance that is that's radioactive. So the half-life of radium is 1,690 years. But that gives us something, doesn't it? It says if you have 20 grams now, what a half-life says is there will be half of this after that much time. and we're still solving for k. Notice I could give you the rate of decrease. You'd say hey, the rate of decrease, decrease is um, whatever percentage. That'd be negative, so like let's say negative 15%. That'd be negative 0.15 as your k. Or if we say decrease 15%, negative 0.15 for your k. Most of the time though, they tell you how much you have and, and what the half-life is as far as a, a length of time. So let's say we have 20 grams now. There will be half of it, that's 10, in this amount of time. Do you see that will let you solve for K? In general, they don't have to give you this to find out half-life. I'm gonna erase this, just please watch this. What if, uh, what if they said the half-life of radium is 1,690 years, they don't tell you how much is present now. Well, what could you do? Couldn't you say, imagine I have one, one gram. How much would be present in 1,690 years? Half a gram, 
or half of whatever that number is. You're going to see this when we go back to our, hey, you have 20 in 1690 years. That's the half-life. You'll have 10. What's the first thing you do? Well, if we have to solve for k, we're going to need a logarithm to undo the exponential, but you have to isolate the exponential first. If we divide both sides by 20, this should be very familiar at this point. If we divide both sides by 20, 10 divided by 20 is, oh, look at that, 1 half. This will happen every time with half-life. That's what half-life means. There's half of it left after that time. Now that we have an exponential isolated, we're ready for an ln, we're going to do a natural log on both sides. And lastly, because we simplify here, we can simply divide by 1690. I hope this triggers something in your brain. I hope that, that when you look at this, you go, oh, yes, natural logs or any logarithm of fractions less than one should give me negatives. Do you remember that? Logarithms increase with bases that are greater than one, which we have. That's basically logarithms increase, and they are negative until x equals one. At that point, one, zero, they cross, and then are they positive? So if you plug in anything between zero and one, your logarithm will give you a negative here. Divided by positive is still going to be a negative. Be careful with your calculators. Make sure you have parentheses after that one half. You want to press ln, one half, in parentheses, and then divide by 1690. I got negative 0. 0.00041. If you get that e to the, uh, well, oh, sorry, uh, the exponential scientific notation, notation, just remember that moves your decimal to the left if it's negative. So we move left four spaces and we get this 0. 0.00041. That is the rate of decrease. This, this radium is decreasing at the rate of 0.041% per year. That is what that means. Not very quick. That's why it takes 1690 years to lose half of it. So what that means for us, we can put this back into our formula. I'm leaving this blank intentionally for a second. on purpose to show you that this really did not have to be here in order for us to figure out our k. Our half-life has always done the same amount. You will just have one half of your amount that you started with or 50%, 0.5, of whatever you started with. That's gonna come in right there, 30%. Um, after that, you're able to find your k, you put it back in your function, and then it can ask you any sort of question, like suppose you start with whatever amount. Find this, or how long it would take here. Suppose you want to find this amount, how, however long it would take, uh, you, can, you can solve for that. We can have do lots and lots of different things with these equations. We just have to solve for k first. Now, in our case, this says that we have 20 grams of radium present. How much will be there in 50 years? All we're looking for is this evaluated for 50 years. You see, this gives you the rate of decrease. It tells you how much you started with. We're saying how much will be there after 50 years has passed. So, we just plug in 50 and evaluate. I got about 19.59 grams, so what this means is that the amount that's going to be left after 50 years has passed is 19.59 grams, considering you start with 20 grams. That's not much. Well, I'm sorry, that's, that's not much decrease. Well, that's true, but if you lose half of it in 1690 years, that means that there would be 10 grams left after 1690 years, right? It would take 1690 years to lose 10 grams. Well, 50 years is not even close to 1690, so you're not going to lose very much in that short amount of time. You are losing, it is decreasing, but the rate is very slow. Hope that makes sense to you. Hope you're seeing the idea of, hey, half-life means one half. I can solve for k. Even if I tell you, don't tell you what to start with, you can still solve for k. And then I can ask you a number of questions after that. I can have you solve for uh, how much would it, it would take to get to a certain amount, how long that would take, all sorts of different questions on that.
All right, we're ready for another example. So C14 has a half-life of 5,730 years. Stop right there. With just that information, you should be able to solve for K. And that's a, exactly what we're going to do first. We're gonna solve this for K. Almost right now. I'm gonna read the rest of it just so you get an idea about where we're going. But that first sentence lets you solve for K and that's a must if you wanna answer any of the questions. So we're gonna, we're gonna pause right there. Now, if a dead tree has 30% of the C14 it originally did, when did it die? That 30%, that is used after you have found K. Some students, they really want to make the K 0 0.30. That's not what that 30% is. I understand it. It's like, oh, that's a rate. It's really not. If I had given you a rate, I would say the rate of decrease is 30%. And you could say, oh, okay, that's negative 0 0.30 for my K. That's not what's happening here. What's happening is we're going to use our half-life to figure out our K. And then this next sentence says, now that you've done that, Tell me how long it takes to achieve 30%. That's a different story and it comes in later. It asks something like, how much is going to be present in 50 years, but a little bit differently it has you solve for a time. So number one, you got to find your K first. The half-life statement up there is enough to do it. The half-life statement says, if you start with any amount, let's call it one, and you give it 5,730 years, how much is going to be left? Half of it. I don't care if you start with 10 and you want to put 5. Start with 100, put 50. Start with 1,000, put 500. The first thing you do is divide, and then you end up getting the one half. Because that is isolated or exponential for us, we just have to take a natural log of both sides. You probably should see at this point that half-life is going to look a lot like this a lot of the time. Because if it says half-life is this many years, well then we know that 0.5 or one half is going to equal e to the whatever that number of years is times k. It'll let you solve for the k. So let's do that. Let's divide by 5,730. Okay, try to be as precise as possible. Don't round this as much as you're able to. So we, because we have to deal with a really small number, we really want to be as precise as we can be. So what that means is that we have this rate of decrease. Why decrease? Well, it's negative. That negative exponent would make this 1 over e to some other power. That is a rate of decrease. It's decreasing at, let's see, 0.0121% per year. That's how quickly this carbon-14 is decreasing. That's the rate of decrease right there. So what we're going to do now is going to rewrite this formula that we have, but using this information. I also hope you're seeing this is a several-step process. This isn't just you plug in all the numbers and you get it. You first have to use your, your information to figure out your K. And then on your second step, like after you found your K and after you've plugged in your formula, then you can answer anything else. Now, the next question is a little bit confusing for a lot of people to go, wait a minute. What do you mean 30%? I don't know how much I originally had. How am I supposed to find 30% of it? Well, here's the point. No matter what you originally had, if there's 30% of it remaining, this is going to end up being 0 0.30 equal to whatever your exponential is. Why? Well, because how would you do this? You start with some amount. Let's call it one. Now, I don't care if, you call it, if it's one or a hundred or a million. It doesn't really matter. If we know our rate of decrease, and we know that the tree had 30% of its original carbon-14, so if we start with, let's pretend it's one gram, how much would be left? 0.3 grams. That's 30% of what I started with. Now, what if it wasn't one gram? Well, if it was uh, 10 grams, well then what's 30% of 10? Three. What if it had 100 grams? What's 30% of that? would be 30. But the very first thing that you would do in any of the cases is you'd have to solve the exponential. You have to solve for t. So if you did that, you have to isolate it. If you isolate it, you have to divide both sides by 10. But wait a minute. If In this case, if, if you are going to find 30% of this number and then divide it by this number, you're going to get 0 0.30 or 30% or whatever percentage it is every time. So if I divide 3.0 by 10 or 0 0.30 by 1 or 30 by 100, I'm going to end up getting 0 0.30 no matter what, as I isolate that exponential.
I guess that's just to say that when they give you a percentage, it's much like doubling. It's actually much like half-life. If you did, if you remember the half-life, this said you have half of what you started with. 50% of what you started with after that amount of time. It lets you solve for K. Now it's saying, okay, uh, you have 30% of what you started with, 0 0.30 of whatever you started with. Like, call it one, it doesn't really matter. Because what's, good, what's it saying is you have 30%, now figure out the time that it took to get that 30%. So same exact idea. It's just now you're looking for the time it's taking. And since we have the K, we're allowed to do that. Let's do a natural log of both sides. And I'm just working it down. We, we do an ln. Of course, this composes a function's inverse cancels. If we divide both sides by that negative 0 0.000121, hopefully you recognize I have an ln of some value less than 1 that's a negative divided by another negative should give me a positive. That makes sense. Time should be in the future here. Uh, or some positive value that's saying this is how long ago this tree died. I am getting 9,950.2 years ago is how long ago this tree died. And what that means is that that long ago this tree would have died and it would have 30% of the original carbon-14 that it had back then. And so they go backwards to try to date that. The last thing I'm going to mention is this number is, is definitely off. And the reason why is because I rounded pretty heavily right there. It didn't look like it. I went to like the, what, sixth decimal place. But I cut off a lot of numbers. So when you do that, you're going to really affect this outcome. So I'm saying about 9,950.2 because I didn't want to write out a whole bunch of digits. But in actuality, you probably shouldn't round this at all, to be honest with you. Um, but that's that's just what I had to do to make you understand what the rate was here. So I did that. But this is probably off by, I don't know, two or three years. Uh, so anyhow, I hope that makes sense. I hope that you're seeing that half-life takes a percentage after a certain amount of time solves for K. And that's exactly what this is doing. It's saying, what is the amount of time for which you to get that percentage? Uh, so I hope I've, I've cleared that up. What we're going to do, in your mind at least, what we're going to do now is come back with one more example, kind of a fun one, and then, uh, then we'll be done. Last one. We're going to talk about a Newton's Law of Cooling problem. I kind of like these. I also want to tempt you to get into differential equations because we cover this much, much, much more at length. We talk about where this actually comes from. It's pretty neat. Uh, so Newton's Law of Cooling is, is kind of cool. Um, obviously, this comes from um, how long it takes fig newtons to cool once they take them out of the, the oven. Um, so anyway, Newton's Law of Cooling says, how long is it going to take if something that is a different temper, temperature from the ambient to reach a certain temperature? So let's imagine. Turkey. Uh, I don't actually like turkey comes out of an oven, but some people do, and I am always responsible for carving the turkey. I don't know why, but that's just my job, I guess. So a turkey comes out of the oven at 100 degrees Celsius, and it's 80 degrees Celsius in five minutes. When will it be 50 degrees Celsius so that I don't burn my fingers when I cut it? And I keep my house at 30 degrees Celsius. So I'm going to time this so that right when I cut it, I cut it, I can serve it. It's nice and hot. People tend to enjoy it. And if you don't think that I actually go through the math to figure this stuff out in your head, you're dead wrong, because I would certainly do this on Thanksgiving Day to make sure that it's just right. So anyhow... Let's go ahead and figure out what all this stuff means. When we deal with Newton's Law of Cooling, there's a one more variable that you really need to understand. It's the T. T stands for ambient temperature. And so what we do, whether something is higher than or lower than, Newton's Law of Cooling will tell you a relationship for how long it takes to reach a certain temperature or what the temperature will be after a certain amount of time. Now, what about if that's negative? Well, if you plug in something less than your ambient, then it's colder than that, like taking something out of the freezer. Well, that's reverse cooling. It's called heating. But Newton's Law of Cooling will still work for that. So it compares the initial temperature of your item with the ambient, and then that is also your ambient temperature. So we're going to fill out a couple things right now to make sure that we understand that. 
when they say ambient, that is the surrounding temperature to which you are exposing this thing that you want to heat or cool. So when we read about the turkey, uh, the ambient temperature would be the, the temperature of the house. So the temperature after a certain amount of time is given by the ambient temperature plus the difference between the thing that you're heating or cooling, in this case the turkey, and the ambient temperature. I'm going a little slower here because it's newer. So here's what we would say. We'd say the ambient temperature is 30. When I initially take out my turkey, it is 100 degrees. So the difference would be 30, 100 minus 30. It's going to give us 70. Now keep in mind what we need to do. We have to solve for K first. It's a must. you got to find the rate of cooling or anti-cooling heating uh, in the situation first. So we're not there yet. I'm just cleaning this up a little bit. So we would get 30 plus 70 e to the kt. Now comes in this, this next statement. So we've said the initial temperature, the initial temperature right here is 100 degrees minus ambient gives us 70. Okay, ambient was 30. We knew that here, we knew that here. Now this next piece, it's 80 degrees in five minutes. Oh, that relates a future value with a time. That is how we go and solve for k. That's how it's been every time with uh, exponential growth or decay. So in five minutes, so our time unit is minutes, in five minutes, this stuff will equal 80 degrees. That's all there is to it. So it's going to be 80 degrees in five minutes. You still had to obey this, right? You still, ambient temperature is still 30. The difference is still 70. In five minutes, it will be 80 degrees. We're going to solve for that K right now. Of course, you have to isolate the exponential, right? There's just one more step. Subtract your 30. If we divide by 70, and we take an LN on both sides, And lastly, if we divide by 5, we have a good expression for k. Now, if I wanted to be very accurate, I wouldn't approximate that. I would leave it, I would put it right there. And then when I multiplied, when I solve for t, I'd have a very awkward thing to use, but it would be more accurate. I'm going to write a decimal right now, even though I'm going to lose some... Um, some exactness, I want to show you the rate. So that's why I'm doing that. So I got k is about negative 0 0.0673. What that says is that there's a, a negative 6.73% decrease in temperature every, whatever the time period is, every minute. So every minute is losing 6.73% of its temperature. Well, as based on a scale of 100. Um, so what that allows us to do, though, that allows us to put this right here and then solve for the time it's going to take to reach 50 degrees. So we've understood it, we've put some numbers in the correct place, we've used another piece of information to solve for k, and now we have a formula that's usable for us. So now we're going to answer the last question. How long will it take in order for it to reach 50 degrees? So all this is set. How long says what's the time when our future temperature is now 50? So how long is it going to take for it to hit a future value of 50?
That's based on our original equation that we got. We just put our k in there, and now we're going to solve for that t. So subtracting 30, dividing by 70, taking a natural logarithm on both sides, And finally, dividing by negative 0 0.0673. All right, I got 18.61. Now remember, this is minutes. That's what was given right here to us. So in 18.61 minutes, this turkey will have dropped from 100 to 50 degrees Celsius, according to my ambient temperature, so that I can cut into it and not burn my fingers. Like I do every year. So anyhow, um, one more thing. Does it make sense? Does it make sense that it took that long? Because it, it, took, it took only five minutes to drop 20 degrees. Why would it take that much longer to drop another 30 degrees? Well, it does make sense because exponential decay, it drops quickly and then it drops slower and slower and slower and slower and slower and slower. And slower, and slower. So imagine this, if you're losing 6.7% per, of your, your temperature, let's say, then there's a lot of temperature to start. You're gonna lose big amounts. But as you start losing temperature, 6.73% is less than it was at the beginning because you lost some. It's like the opposite of compounding interest. You're losing, and so you're making less and less and less, or taking less and less and less away. So it should take longer, it should take longer to lose the same amount of temperature as you start getting cooler uh, or heating up. Theoretically, will this turkey ever reach 30 degrees? Ever. Will it ever get down to the point where it's equal to the temperature of my house, theoretically? Practically, yeah. Theoretically, no. And I need you to see the last thing I'm going to point out. Look right here. This is an exponential. This is an exponential with negative, so a downward exponential, decrease in exponential. This is a vertical stretch, and this right here is a vertical shift. I'll oh, see it. That's a vertical shift up 30. That's a horizontal asymptote shift up 30. This has a horizontal asymptote. It will never, theoretically, reach 30 degrees. It'll always lose, but it'll never, never get down to that. Isn't that interesting? So that's that's all that interplays with this. I hope that you've seen the exponentials that I've explained it to you. Um, I've really tried to make it as thorough as possible without giving you a background in differential equations because that's just not the scope of this class. So hopefully it's interesting. Hopefully it made sense to you. And we are now, we're really done with our exponentials. That's about as much as I can teach you. We're going to move on to something completely different. We're going to move on to sequences and series. Now they do relate to exponentials, uh, but they are a, a different idea. So we'll talk about those. I'll give you an introduction to sequences and introduction to series. We'll talk about arithmetic and geometric sequences and series, and then a proof of induction and, and that, um, and then we start talking about some systems of, equ of equations for a little bit before moving on to trigonometry. Hope you're having fun.